Hey folks, in today's episode, I have the opportunity, or I had the opportunity of speaking with three lovely, fantastic, wonderful, bright women, Karen Justice, Karen Smith Rassicott, and Rebecca Lachance. They are combined authors of one fantastic book called Widows Among Us. Now, it's not just for women, really. It's for men and women, but it is geared towards women, and it deals with loss, grief, preparation, all of that. So you're going to get a lot of answers from this, but you're also going to have a good time. You're going to laugh. You're going to smile. You're going to maybe cry, but it's going to make you think about things. So please sit back, watch, and listen, and enjoy the show. Let's get to it. But I just want to first uh, start off by saying thank you very much. And the three of you ladies, I think, have put out a, you know, this might be the wrong choice of words, but a winner of a book. And I say that because it is important. A lot of us, a lot of us, well, men and women, but this is really geared towards women today. But I hope all the men out there in the audience understand that this mm -hmm. is for them as well. Yes. Right. So your book is really called is called widows among or widows among us and you have the three of yourselves the authors you have karen justice hi karen and then we have um rebecca rebecca lachance is it pronounced lachance uh, yes. kind of like french lachance uh, hello. hello and that's rebecca there and then we have karen help me with your Last name, Karen Smith. Rassicott. Rassicott. Yes. So welcome, everybody. And, you know, the inside story is we have tall Karen and we have short Karen, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ladies, I know it's got to be the obvious thing, but I just want to ask if you could briefly give us uh, your story, uh, starting with, I'm going to say it. Sure, <laughs> I'm in love with Morocco and I had been there several times and felt like I wanted to share it with others so I was back there in 2018 looking around I stuck something on Facebook and said hey I'm here I'm looking into things for a trip I want to plan next year let me know if you're interested bing 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 bing, bing. yeah I had a lot of cousins uh, respond and Rebecca and Karen um, on the friend side, the, bless their hearts, they were the only ones in the family, uh, outside the family who joined us. So uh, patience <laughs> is a virtue. And um, it was getting to know each, we were acquaintances. We got to know each other a little bit better on that trip. And you know, I'll let one of the other ones perhaps tell the story about how we got to know each other a lot better on that trip. Um, but then each of us, Karen, and I had been widowed before that trip, Rebecca, you know, less than a year afterwards. And we started traveling together one year in, in, in February of 23, in fact, and sitting in front of a fireplace in Sedona. We said, you know, we should write a book. And here we are today. Wow. Uh, Rebecca, I, your, your short part of the story of this. Oh, yourself. yes. Um... Well, my, my short part of it is that we had known each other in passing, you know, we at all were in same business groups, but we really hadn't uh, become close to each other. And um, I, it was when I became a widow, the two Karens uh, realized that they thought that I was having a very, very, very difficult time with my grief process. Um, what they didn't know is that I am neurodivergent and um, I needed to be alone for a very long time. And um, so consequently, I teased them that they were operating out of incomplete data. But, <laughs> but they did. Always a scientist, Rebecca. Always a scientist. <laughs> but they did, you know, it was through their initial effort of uh, starting a... a uh, text messaging back and forth because of it was my husband died during COVID and so we moved into that and um, 
you know, we, like Karen has said, we've been traveling and, um, you know, I'm still neurodivergent and I'm still hard to get to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the world is going to know you now. <laughs> um, Karen Rasikot, yes. Karen Smith Rasikot, what about you? Well, I'll finish short Karen's story on Morocco. Um, we went to a Berber hammam, which is a, uh, it's a spa that they do over there. What we did not know is how the fact that we were going to be stark naked at the end of it because they wash you down and everything. And Rebecca made the comment that we are the only ones besides our husband who have ever seen her tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> So we joke about that was our bonding time. That was when we really got to know each other. And um, and like I said, Rebecca was widowed a year later, and we kind of said, yeah, you know, we need to reach out because we, Karen and I, had already been through that. I was actually um, had already been and still am remarried. Um, so we'd been widows for. I'm actually. I'm the youngest, but I've been widowed the longest. I've been widowed almost, mm -hmm. well, what, 14 and 14? He was 2010, so 14 years. Um, and so, you know, we kind of were like, you know, we need to reach out to Rebecca. And so from there, we just, you know, the friendship has grown. We learned a lot about each other writing the book. We learned how to work together. We learned what buttons we should not be pushing <laughs> because we want to <laughs> stay friends. Um, you know, so... As with any partnership as well as friendship, you know, it, it is, it is grown and yeah. continues to grow. Uh, the reason I wanted to get a little story from each one of you and the, the three of you ladies are all accomplished uh, women, but I wanted to have the audience know that um, no matter what your background is, this is something that's common. Absolutely. Amongst and between all women that go through this and all men that go through this. And we're talking about loss of your spouse. Um, and it could be a loss of, you don't even have to be married, but mm -hmm. a, a loss is what I'll, I'll say. Um, now, you know, jumping over to your, your book again, um, Widows Among Us, you, you kind of break it down into like four four parts, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm just gonna read them off real quick. So, and we don't have to really go through it because of course we want people to get the book. <laughs> Right. We don't want to tell everything. We don't want to tell this full story. But again, it's broken down into four parts. And, you know, the first part is what we just kind of went through. It's the story of the three of you, each one of you. And then on the second part, you have steps on how to help prepare, which I really want to kind of touch on because that's very, very important. Um, we're talking about DNRs and things like that and getting your affairs in order. And then it's your journey through grief. And, you know, like you said, Rebecca, your, your two pals there didn't know that you were neurodivergent. And they're like, hey, hey, wake up. Come on out. And you're like, probably in your mind, leave me alone. <laughs> Pretty much. But, you know, each, yeah, each one of us goes through a different grieving process. Mm -hmm. And it, it could be one day or it could be one year or it could be 10 years. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Absolutely. Uh, and then... Uh, Step number four, and I don't know if all three of you are in this position and lucky enough, but to find love again. So, you know, that's another one that I'd really like to, to touch on. But um, Chuck, and if I can interrupt, um, one other key yeah. part of the book is how to help and support a widow that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we put some uh, basic suggestions on maybe some things that aren't the best thing to do, and then some ideas that people might not think about. Oh, those, yes. And again, please uh, feel free to throw out any of these suggestions during our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't mind, if, if I ask you right off the bat, um, you, you do talk about something about under the influence of grief, you know, the grief-induced brain fog. What is that? How do people know that they are in there? Um, can one of you take that take up? Take it away, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my baby. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah gr brain fog really is, it, it's not a mental illness. Some people worry about it that they think that they're becoming mentally ill. And it is not a mental illness. It is actually a, a physiologic process that your brain interprets the death of your spouse 
as a trauma. And so you have um, stress hormones that are released. And part of the effect of those stress hormones is that it does make your thinking processes foggier. You're not as sharp with them as you could be. And um, for example, I myself, I totally lost the ability to remember anything. I mean, within two seconds of somebody telling me something, it was gone, totally gone. And um, for someone such as me, who as Karen had made, had made reference, you know, of being in, in science a lot, you know, my brain was my bright spot, if you will. My brain and my ability to think was my survival and how I approached the world. And suddenly I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. And it had significant impact from the standpoint that either I didn't remember being told this or my accountant didn't tell me was that um, I should make sure that federal income tax was taken out of all of Frank's retirement accounts once they were put into my name. That didn't happen. Like I said, I don't know if it went whoosh with everything mm -hmm. else. Um, but the following year, I had a $12,000 tax bill because I had not paid any federal income tax. Mm -hmm. What I learned to do, first of all, I was shocked at how poor my memory was during that period of time. And what I learned to do was to take someone with me, which we refer to as our second set of ears. I, I would take someone with me and they would write down all of the answers for me. You know, what they had the questions, they wrote down the answers so that I had something in wow. hand that I could go back and say, oh yes, I should have made sure that the federal income tax was taken out. Um, <clears throat> and that carried through for me, not only in the financial aspect, but it also in the health aspect as well. Um, you know, when your brain is just not processing the information that you're giving, you really do need somebody to be sitting there in that doctor's office with you. Again, writing down what the doctor has said, you know, and asking the questions that you forgot to ask. And yeah, you, you, you say that brain fog and health, that, that's, I think, a huge thing because people yes. forget to eat or they don't yes. feel like eating and then their health goes down. Um, so, uh, you know, it, I, I hope people don't r think that we're really minimizing certain things that we, we talk about. And I might joke about things because now I understand where that PhD comes in at the end of your name. <laughs> Very scientific. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, being prepared, I, I, I'd like to ask, can, Short, Karen. <laughs> you're you're going to really hate me for That's saying okay. that. We're used to end. it. <laughs> it's an easier way. <laughs> yeah, you started it. Um, you know, with, with the, this preparation that we kind of uh, mentioned at the very beginning, what is this preparedness? What What is it? What's, how do you prepare? What are we talking about here, being prepared? Well, there are probably two sides to that because... I, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and um, blessedly we had three years of notice. Some people have three months or less. Um, so I worked at being emotionally prepared as well as all the details that um, Tall Karen has written a, a, a workbook about on uh, details to get your paperwork in order. Um, so my late husband and I had time to review our wills, redo our wills, make sure that we had the um, medical directive done, um, think about the beneficiaries on all the, you know, the, R, the um, retirement accounts, the insurance policies, look at the joint ownership of the property we owned, um, think about his last wishes, what, what and how did he want to die and what did he want to do? What did he want done after his death? 
the the horrible details to think about, but the essential ones because it's my firm belief that it sounds weird, but grief is a lot easier when you don't have the stress of mm -hmm. facing these challenges as well as the loss. I, I to to me yeah. I. I have jokingly said to several people that our book should be a wedding present. And, I, I, and I'm not being light with that because as soon as you have joint property, mm -hmm. you have um, problems to face if one of the spouses passes away. So yeah. probably not a wedding present, but you get my point. Early, early is good. Don't wait until you're 39, 59, or 79. Do it early in your marriage. And, uh, yes, 100% agree on that. Um, and I'm going to add know, a little bit to that, too, um, yeah, just yeah, briefly. Yeah. Sure. My husband died very unexpectedly at the age of 49. He had just had his 49th birthday, died of a heart attack. We owned a tax and accounting firm, and he did financial investments. So we had all of the paperwork in place. We had wills. We had, you know, whatever paperwork we needed. But we had never revisited our life insurance. And I refused to have any what if conversations with him. So when he, and we, again, we owned a tax and accounting business and we had 12 employees and 500 clients. When he died, I did not know what to do because we had never talked about it. So while we had paperwork taken care of and I took care of all the finances, I knew everything I needed to know, but we were not prepared. And it caused a lot of difficulty for me. It's, Finance and things like that are huge. Yes. And, you know, you, many of us work, or at least one of the spouses work. And, you know, in many situations, we'll just say, um, I'm, I'm not going to be chauvinistic, but it may sound that way. But men are working and then the, the men pass. But the men need to be re reminded, hey, do you have your 401k of who, who's the beneficiary? What's going on? And, you know, we tend to forget that. And then the other thing too, other Karen that you touched upon is what to do after your husband, your spouse passes away. That I think is one um, important thing, critical, crucial, that is like secondary. And the reason I say that it's important is because you, if there are family members left on his side, oh, brother might come out and say oh no that's not what he wanted and then a sister would come and say no this is what he told me if you don't have something written down yep there's going to be turmoil amongst uh the family and family members absolutely. which will cause absolutely more stress, absolutely right yeah, grief grief is shared by grief is experienced by people in so many different ways and oftentimes they uh, express it with anger or frustration with somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And and you're right. Having it written down enables a softer conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to ask each one of you about this grief, grieving process and how long it took. I don't want to be um, insincere or flippant about it. But uh, Karen, just now you were talking. Um, how long... It's that it's a process that never ends. You never forget. Yep. But what would you say? How long did it take you to accept that grief? So, and 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 this is one of the interesting things about our book is that we each tell our story of going through the process. Right? Um, for me, I had an accounting mm -hmm. business. My husband died three days prior to the April fifteenth deadline. So there was a lot that had to be done immediately. Um, I am kind of, I'll give you an example. When my first daughter went to college, I dropped her off. She was going to a summer, teaching at a summer camp that summer. And I knew that was kind of it. I dropped her off, cried all the way home, and then came home and turned her bedroom into my office. Because to me, that was productive, made something good out of it, right? And so when Sam died, um, obviously you've got that turmoil and everything but for me being productive is good so i cleaned out all of his clothes in the closet so i could have more space and i got rid of things that i knew i didn't need so i so for me that was turning making something positive out of it but over time mm -hmm. or i should say and over time and as well over time it for me it was like he was dead 
He was not coming back. I loved him, but I wanted to also live a life I wanted to live. So I actually started dating about a year later and got married a year after that. And I'm, that's been what Bob and I have been together for 12 years um, and counting. So it, it, it really depends on the person's part of it is the relationship itself right? And part of it is the person's psyche. For me, I was like, I loved being married. I loved having a companion, you know, all the time. And so I was fine with getting married again. My kids were in college. And so it's not like they were home or I had little ones or anything like that. So, you know, it was, that's what worked for me. Wow. You know, I was going to ask you the question about the second time around, but you just went (laughs) right for it. So I had this gut feeling. Uh, well, Karen, but, Karen uh, can tell her story too. Each so, and yeah. every one of you. Yeah, are all of you? Have you found a no. second? No. no? Um, before you, before Karen, you share, and I'm going to ask you why on your side, Rebecca. I just want to share that uh, this month was 15 years when I lost mine, but she was not my wife. But she was somebody that I was with for 10 years that I did not see for. 28 years and I told her back in when she was in fifth grade and I was in sixth I'm gonna marry you someday Uh. and then like I said it's been 15 years since she's uh, passed Mm -hmm. so I kind of understand a little bit about the grief grieving process how long and I have not yet gone out or seen anyone either so Rebecca I (laughs) I'm with we're 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 together (laughs) we're together but um other Karen down here in my left corner. <laughs> this is like yeah. the Brady Bunch or the Hollywood Squares or something. I'm in the top right on my screen. <laughs> um, I'm kind of like Karen in many ways in that I started dating yeah, less, about a year after my husband passed away. But I always I felt that the, that September afternoon when my husband came out of the hospital um uh, room and said that he had pancreatic cancer that was that was startling um shook my world and then i had three years of of dealing with the the grief and trying to hide it and trying to be strong and trying to grieve all at the same time so um basically I didn't go through the fact that I have lived with change all my life. My condo that is my 30th home I've lived in, I went to seven schools between kindergarten and sixth grade. So, and I, my husband was in the military for 31 years, so it was constantly changing places and jobs. So I'm accustomed to change and saying, okay, this is what it is, kind of like Karen. This is what it is, what do I do now? Pick up the resources I have and move on. So I picked up myself and I started, I went on online match programs, dating programs, and found the love of my life second time around. That's a great attitude. And um, yeah, and, and it's a good thing that you said that because if your husband happens to watch this <laughs> and you say, oh, you know, <laughs> it was just filling the, the <laughs> void. <laughs> Well, I did, I'm not married to the new love of my life. We don't, oh. no, we do not live together and we are not planning to be married. We love it just exactly like it is. He's 45 minutes away from me. I'm glad you added that in because it's not necessary to mm-hmm. be married. Mm-hmm. Um, so that leads me to, I don't know if she's to your left, to your right, if she's on the bottom of your I'm screen. Over but... here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rebecca. You know what? Here's what people are going to say. What's wrong with her? How come she's not, you know, because yeah. I'll get the yeah. same thing. 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, what's uh, going on? It's, it's a deliberate choice for me from the standpoint that mm-hmm. um, Frank was my second husband. We were married for 25 years. He was the love of my life. And um, we had a bond that was, first of all, our brains just attracted each other tremendously, but he also was neurodivergent. (laughs) He also was neurodivergent. And so that we kind of melded into this manner of seeing and supporting each other. And uh, I have to tell you, I've been known throughout my life and I've been called the just the facts 
ma'am, just the facts, woman. And I personally, I was shocked as all get out that I experienced such a profound grief experience. I did, I really didn't think I had it in me, you know, to, to be that affected emotionally. And uh, I really was. And so my grief probably was exhibiting itself for a good 18 months to two years before I was able to get myself moving. And, and it's a deliberate choice not to go out and look for another partner because, first of all, I don't think that anybody could reach the bar that Frank set. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I just don't want to, and my brain can't, expend the energy to fit someone else into my space, to fit someone else and their idiosyncrasies into my life, to bring in other complications. And I'm happy as I am. You know, uh, and you, you said that word choice, and the three of you made your choice as to how you want to uh, continue mm -hmm. living. So. That, that's one thing that people have to remember. It is your choice mm -hmm. whether you remain single or you remarry or whatever. And the time frame should not matter to anybody else but Correct. yourself. We do say uh, that whether in our, you know, how to help a widow. <laughs> Don't tell her what she should or should not be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't um, don't try to get her to don't match her up at uh, some dinner yeah, party. Yeah. You know, chill. Let her let her yep. do her thing. Unless she asks for help on that. Don't play matchmaker. And now I'm going to get really personal on this thing. And nobody has the answer, but I'm just going to throw it out there because I know that this is, this stops a lot of people from um, being intimate or being with somebody else again. So say you've been together with your um, husband, your wife for 10, 15, 20 plus years. You're used to that person. You're used to them seeing what you look like. And then they're gone. Mm -hmm. it, now, don't lie to me. Isn't it embarrassing thinking, you know, I look different? What are they going to think? <laughs> Karen, now there yep. it goes. Yeah, but I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> That's pretty much. I mean, I'm at that point in my life. It, hey, this is me. Take it or leave it. <laughs> yeah. But that is a part of that process that you have to go through again, right? right? Like you, you don't feel comfortable with yourself any, again. Uh, it, it, and it stops a lot of people from um, being happy again because they, they feel that they can't choose because it's a, mm -hmm. that's a block. Well, and, yeah. and I even remember telling, you know, my oldest daughter and I, I said to her, I said, I don't think I'll ever find someone that's going to put up with me the way your dad did. Right. So it's not only that, but it's a, you know, especially if you get married at a younger age, right? We got married in our early 20s. And so like we were young and we were in love. And so we kind of grew together, but we also grew, you know, learned our idiosyncrasies, you know, yeah, you know, okay, so mm, mm -hmm. we'll put a little bit of weight on there, whatever, it's fine. But then all of a sudden you're doing that with a new person and you are in my case, I was in my early 50s. And so, you know, it, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't want him to see me, you know, I don't, I, What's he gonna think? What's he gonna, you know, how's he gonna act? Oh, I just said mm -hmm. something stupid, so, you know. So it, it's like you have to get used to that all over again. And it's a lot easier in your 20s than it is in your 50s and older. <laughs> so yes, but the yeah. other person's probably uh, thinking the same thing. So communication. <laughs> yes. After 70, uh, yeah, you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Take it or leave it, right? Rebecca, I, I, yeah, Rebecca, I'm going to say my, my pet peeve on any of that with somebody is if we use a dishwasher, they got the dishes need to be <laughs> small to large, tines up, spoons all in, forks all, every, and I mean I'm I understand. <laughs> I do. <laughs> or if you're like me, you could just tell your husband, just do it all. Don't let me look in there because it's not done correctly. But as long as you do it all yourself and I don't have to go behind you, then it's your job. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> I, have a, I have a feeling 
If it's anyone like Rebecca, that's no, just I not going to work. Exactly. You're going to wake no. up at two, three. You're going to look uh, do it. and redo it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I go as bad as, um, you know, laundry. People just throw it in. It's like, no, 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 no. You got to separate it all before you wash it. And you need to separate it before it goes in the dryer. I may have to take a test to see if I... <laughs> No, you know, like, eh, because that's I'm half joking, but half not because we're just kind of going off topic. People are finding out later and later in their life that they this is true. Are. This is true. Yeah. So, yep. but yes. enough said about that. This is <laughs> yes. about widows yes. among us. <laughs> I, I'm going to say yes. It, this is needed. Mm -hmm. This is needed. And, and we it, have dozens it, of pre uh, dozens of pre orders already too. And the, and the Excellent. thing is, too, is, yes, it does talk about widows and everything. It's not a sob story, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, mm -hmm. It has some really good practical information in there, but it is really a story of the three of us, how we handled this traumatic event in our life, the different way we handled it, the different things we did or didn't do. You know, it, it's a, and, and who we are today because of what we went through and yeah. how we handled it. Right. That's mm -hmm. a big part of the story too. Yeah. Like I was a very, very shy person before Sam died because I didn't have to really take a lot of responsibility. I let him take it all. And all of a sudden now I am owning a business and three kids in college. And my mom had been, when my dad died just six months prior to Sam. So there was a lot on me and I wanted to crawl into my little comfort zone corner and I couldn't. And I'm a very different person today because of that experience. So I know Sam is loving every minute of it. Um, but, you know, he, we often say, you know, he's sitting up there laughing at us like, ah, look what I made you do. <laughs> but I know he'd love who I am today because he always saw that part of me and I never did. So, And I'm sure that all three of your stories are going to resonate mm -hmm. with someone, mm -hmm. some part of the story. Um, and this, I think this is a situation where you can say it'll resonate with everyone. It's just one of your stories is going to resonate with someone, which is going to be everyone. And the other thing, too, is, um, you know, Karen, like you, you were saying that Sam is up there laughing and, you know, cracking jokes. I think we have to also remember that our spouse, our loved one, that's what they would want for us mm -hmm. to continue mm -hmm. living absolutely they don't want you to die right. with them um so that goes back to like you're saying too rebecca as far as remaining healthy and eating not only physically but mentally yes. healthy and you know i think you mentioned too karen keeping busy mm -hmm. keeping yourself busy and stuff like that um uh, I it's, I just really want to go through your book, but I don't want everybody to go, hey, we just got it all on the podcast. I don't need to pre-order anything. Please don't do that. But I want folks to know that they could go to www.threewidows.com, and that's three spelled mm -hmm. out and not the number three. So go there. Um, you see the their story, a little bit about it. And, uh, yeah, this is something really it, needed I, I, um, that's, I was just mm. going to say that's one of the other things too and it's actually the one section um, on being prepared is called mamas teach your daughters to be widows because part of what we realize so not only is it about getting your paperwork and finances in order but it's also about the fact that it's a subject that is not talked about but there is I know somebody else is going to know this but there's a very large percent of, of, of women that become widows um and what average age of 59 59 I believe, is 59 59, 59. Is the average age of widowhood yes. and so it is a good possibility that it is a reality for a lot of women and yet it's never talked about so that is one of the things that we want to do is to bring that conversation to the forefront so that we can honestly say it's scary it sucks it's not anything you'd ever wish to go through, but it's likely that you will, and you will survive, and you will be okay. You might be a different person, but you will be okay. And that's a large part of why we wrote the book. Right. Uh, it's okay, and there's a way, is one of the things that I said as we started to do, to do this, is it's okay, whatever you're feeling, and there's a way beyond it. Mm -hmm. So just you know, reassuring them, 
reassuring the readers and everybody that is listening, everybody we talk to, you know, it's going to be different for every one of us. And it's going to be a different story beyond widowhood. It's always a different story before that. Mm -hmm. But um, it's going to it's going to be all right. And to Karen's point, 2,800 women a day become widowed. We don't have the numbers for how in many the US. get widowed. In the U.S. In the U.S., yeah. And that's only wow. in the United States. 2,800 women a day. So there's a large number of women who, as Karen says, um, are going to be facing that this week. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask the, uh, the scientist, the PhD person here, this question. Yes. Rebecca, <laughs> is it safe to say if somebody's having a difficult time going through the grieving process to get professional help? We've had, we, <clears throat> the three of us have had this discussion and we, what we would like to say is that, um, you can indeed talk with people, you can find people to talk with, but you need to make sure that that person, if you're going for professional help, that person is going to be the one who's listening to you, who can hear what you have to say and, and help you through the process where you are feeling more comfortable. Personally, even though I had a very, very rough um, grieving process, I did not go through any professional work from the standpoint that I came to the realization that my process was more about a spiritual reckoning for myself. And mm -hmm. I had to work and develop and listen to my soul, to my spirit, to work through this process about what was happening to me. and. A spiritual reckoning can only be done through internal work. It can't be done talking with another professional because they may not understand what you're trying to say in that, that spiritual aspect. Yeah. But there are uh, organizations that do support widows and some widows, it's kind of like 50-50. Some widows feel like that they did receive support from those organizations. Others felt that the organization didn't help them. And so what they may have done was found someone in their community like us, you know, like the Karens with me, who could just sit and listen. You know, and they didn't have to give answers. Yeah. They didn't have to help me heal, you know. They just had, all they did was listen. And I think that's what, and, what we need is, you know, that we need to have someone who can listen and someone who will not judge and someone who will not try to heal you prematurely that's well said and there 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 you go folks every single one of us is an individual we all grieve in different ways we all process things differently and we all solve or resolve things at different mm -hmm. times uh, so don't again don't let somebody say well it's been a month. You should get out of it. What's wrong? with it? It's like, no, 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 no. It's again, like we said, you know, Karen and I were talking is saying it could be one day. It could be one week. It could be one month. It could be 10 years. You know, one of the things that I could add to that is that um, we did a lot of interviews with other widows, you know, what their experiences were. And um, one woman came up to us after the interview and she said, I've been a widow for 20 years and no one ever asked me about what my experience was. And she had tears in her eyes as she was telling us this. Mm. And that was kind of like a big light bulb about how society tends to view grieving as a one and done event. Mm -hmm. And it's not because, you know, yeah you may have this giant balloon of grief at the beginning that just keeps hitting a grief button. And as time goes by, the balloon gets a little smaller, but the balloon is always there. And you can have trigger events 10 and 15 years later, like your daughter gets married and all of a sudden you, you know, you're crying in grief because your husband wasn't there to see her get married. You know, so it's, it's something that's there with your life. That's yeah. one of the reasons we yeah. added that chapter about mama's teach your daughters to be widows. But basically, our 
that and our purpose for this book is that, as Rebecca said, it's been a subject that's not talked about. We want to pull the curtain back and shine the light on the fact that this is reality, folks, and this is how, this is what you're going to face, and this is how you can deal with it. And as I said, it's okay, whatever you're experiencing, it's okay. Talk to somebody who will listen, and but you're going to be all right. You know, you just be yeah. confident that you're going to be all right. But talk about it. Ask people, you know, not just, you know, are you okay? You know, because they're going to say, yeah. At, you know, it's like that leading question, the, 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 the question that's not a yes or a no. Or it's just inviting somebody over to sit on the deck with a glass of wine and watch a gorgeous sunset and sit there quietly. And sooner or later, if she wants to talk, she's going to talk. He, mm -hmm. the widower, too. Mm -hmm. This has been fantastic. And folks, remember, go to www.threewidows.com, and that's three spelled out. But I want to ask each one of you something before we close out. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation today with Karen Justice, Karen Rassicott, and Rebecca Lachance. Lachance. I got to get that down someday. Anyhow, um... We've got some fun questions and answers coming up right now. So please stick around to listen for the end part of this podcast. And remember, if you're a pet owner, please be responsible and have your pets spayed or neutered. Let's get right back to the show. What your favorite song or movie is. I don't know. This is way <laughs> off, right? Karen in the upper right corner and my bottom left. <laughs> so I'm oh, gonna I hate being first. Oh, you, okay. oh, which, which Karen is in your, in your corner? <laughs> uh, Make well, it make yeah. it tall, Karen. You know what? We could we tall even Karen. throughout the book we call ourselves short Karen and tall Karen. So don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> tall Karen. I am. I, I'm going to have to say Lord of the Rings. My girls and I, they were in high school and middle oh. school when it came out, and I always read it growing up. Like I read it almost every year. And when the movies came out, it was it's a little insane how many times we've seen the movies. So <laughs> if I don't say that, they'll probably disown me. So All what right. can I say? <laughs> Oh, that's good. Karen down in the other corner? <laughs> well, you know, there are a couple of songs that I really like, but I, I think that probably my theme song could be Willie Nelson's On the Road Again, because <laughs> I have a passion for traveling. You know, I do as well. And I'll tell yeah, you, you're on your it, way to Morocco sometime, ago. right? Yes. Well, six months ago, I was in uh, Amman, Jordan. Ooh. I just got back three days ago from Alaska nice. and in less than a month I'm going to Taiwan and then Okinawa and then over to Yokohama Japan wow, nice. I love it <laughs> love it have fun thanks uh, yeah well Rebecca, my well what do you have for us <laughs> my my favorite movie has uh, all well, has been since the very first time I saw it was um, the last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day Lewis and I will oh. admit to the fact that I have seen the movie about 17 times. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's a purity well, in that movie I, that I, I appreciated. Yeah. Well, you know, the reason I ask that question is it's just, it also, I think, tells the audience and tells me the type of a person, how you think, how you process and how you work and stuff like that so getting our secrets are you <laughs> yes i'm trying my best <laughs> um I, I i've really enjoyed this conversation and i i think it's come across really good and you know as i said early on we may joke and laugh about certain things but this is a mm -hmm. serious thing but um the three of you seem very content very happy so um no, that that's what we should all look for uh, if we have to or if we end up going through this situation. Absolutely. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you as a male saying it to to the ladies there because I learned something too. So. Well, we can talk from our point of view. You know, there are several ways we can't talk about widowhood and we can't talk about it from a male point of view, but many of the experiences mm -hmm. are the mm -hmm. same. Absolutely. Many of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, they are, um, you know, it, it's, I, I, I don't want to spoil anything. So I'm done here. <laughs> what about the three of you? How do you feel? 
Thank, Thank you. you. I think it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we've, we've enjoyed it, yeah, Chuck. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome.